Hello, welcome to Quackalope. Thank you for being here. Today, we are giving you a sprint through 10 rules mistakes we yeah. might have made. Now, this video is going to be titled, like, the might 10 most... Made? I, listen, this video is going to be titled something along the lines of 10 commonly made rules mistakes in Solomon Kane, or 10 mistakes you might make in Solomon Kane. Because there's a lot in this game. Yes, there is. And we just finished filming. Well, we played a few of the smaller scenarios, but we just finished filming a full gameplay series. Uh, I think a four-episode series of... Maybe four. Le Ogar, or the Ogre. Yeah, Le Ogar. Uh, Le Ogar. Where, I mean, genuinely, we had an absolutely fantastic time. Yeah, that was... You should check that out. But it was not free from a few mistakes. And so we took our experience, we took the things we had to double-check in the rule book. we mm -hmm, took the mm -hmm, notes Jan mm -hmm. made along the way, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we're giving you a video that breaks down, well, the lessons we've learned after, I'd say, 20 hours of gameplay plus. So you don't have to experience them yourself. So you don't... And let me be clear, I don't think most of the stuff we're covering here are at fault of the rule book or at fault of, uh, there's just a lot that needs to be managed in this game. And I, so the structure and flow of it is something that we kind of learned while playing and encountering new situations. It's easy to forget rules. It's like yeah. the thing that it's in one sentence, so it's just kind of like in the rule book somewhere. It's there, but you won't probably remember it yeah. at the end of the day. So, <sighs> let's, uh... Ready to begin? Yeah, yeah, Let's, uh, let's start digging into this. Okay, well, uh, take it away. I'm gonna start with one of the most basic and important things we learned mm. throughout the course of the game, mm. and that's going to do with selecting <laughs> player order or the flow. Now, we yes. did, we did understand at the mm -hmm. very beginning of the game, you're going to be able to designate, uh, at the start of every chapter, what turn order you'd like to operate around. Yep. Meaning, first, second, third, fourth. Here's the thing we overlooked and you might as well selecting order at the very start of the chapter is nice gives you strategy wow. allow it sets the course lets you yes. decide who wants to go in yeah. however they wanted to give you more strategy than just that yes you're able to reset mm -hmm. and reselect order at the start of every new round. round which is essential to strategy and critical thinking in this game because it means that if i have a character that is going to be able to leverage or utilize mm -hmm. some of their special abilities and you want to get out before the darkness starts enveloping you or before yep. another character moves out of the way for you to interact with them, this starts becoming really, really important. Essential. Now, the game functioned. Oh, yeah. We were able to move through it. However, for ease of play, strategic control, mm -hmm. and a bit mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. uh, narrative decision, yep. make sure you do this at the start of every round. Really pull them off your boards, reset, look down, and decide what you're doing moving mm -hmm. into the next sequence of events. And if you're looking to make something a little bit more difficult, just use the variance in the rule book. Don't get creative like we did. <laughs> the next one that I want to talk about is actually something that is super key that we weren't super sure about, but was clear along the way, and it showed how important it can be. Donated, reserved, and cloud dice. Or resources. Yeah. One of the key things about this game is that this is a whole campaign book. Ooh. Like, and when I say whole campaign book, I mean, like, these are multiple chapters. I mean, this was a five-hour story that we were journeying through. Yep. And that means that the decisions that we make before will have repercussions of what happens later. But not just that. The development that we do along the course yep. of that will also kind of pass through chapter to chapter. In other words, every player board has two areas. A donated area and a reserved area. Reserved area are dice that you're choosing to keep, and donated dice are dice that people are giving you. Now, anything that falls outside of this, played on cards, mm -hmm. not able mm -hmm. to fit, not given to a friend... Bye-bye. Say goodbye to it. Yes. Because it doesn't matter. It's as lonely as I am on a Thursday afternoon in mid-July. But you know what does matter? Mm. What, what good company is? That when you have dice in those spaces and a chapter ends... Yeah. You get to keep those dice. They carry through. Yes, uh, they do. You, you, you're able to strategically start stockpiling or building or progressing the game. And, and mm -hmm. this was uh, pretty critical to... Pivotal. ...our universal, uh, at least, <sighs> development. Progression. Mm -hmm. Oh, good way of being vague. And, and this resource area... Yeah. Also keeps everything that it has inside of the cloud, which yep. is a pretty neat name for resource That includes blessings, that yep. includes these free dice or yep. the luck dice. Yes, Critical again. Let's uh, let's continue down the journey of strategic choice on player boards. Yes, that's going to have to do. We were playing a four-player esque game. Two players sure. controlling double-handed two, two characters. Mm -hmm. 
in a full four-player game where all boards are on the table, you're going to be able to activate <laughs> your neighbor's middle section. The reason yep. for this is yep. these sections are basically your standard actions. It's mm -hmm. like the universal actions that everyone should get the chance to do. Yes. We have fight, talk, move, any virtue, and explore. That is really important. Yeah, you need that in almost every turn sometimes, and not having access to it makes the game, again, much more complicated slower, than it needed to be. A little be. bit harder to engage with yeah. some of the things that we needed yeah. to. It's like the designers uh, knew this and designed it that way. Yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, however, it still operated and still worked. We just struggled a little bit more along the way. Again, difficulty in the rule book. And You'll all have of fun these, with that. for the record, we, we caught during the gameplay. It's yes, not we like did. We like yes. retroactively are thinking through them. Oh no, of course, of course. Yeah. The, the gameplay is legit. Oh yeah, no, it's hundred yeah, percent. It's real gameplay. It's yeah, real gameplay. Hundred percent. But those middle actions are going to be really important. Now, here's mm -hmm. the thing that I think we got confused on. When you're playing non-four player, when not yep. all boards are on the side, you're going to have boards that set off to the, the to an adjacent location, mm -hmm. and everyone can engage with those boards. However, it's going to cost one more to do your middle action yep. universally across the board. So if we're playing together, I could do your middle action for one extra random die. You could do my middle mm -hmm. action for one extra mm -hmm. random mm -hmm. die. If we weren't playing four player, you could do any of the actions for the base at for the base cost. For the base cost yep. or the middle area, no. which is always base cost also. Base cost as well? Everything. Apparently. Everything on that every action on that board is base cost. Apparently it's base So cost at the end of the day, you you always have the presence of all four virtues, even though there's only two manifesting yeah. at any given time. And now speaking of manifestations. Yeah. Now if we haven't confused you enough off of that, <gasps> let's talk a, a little bit about darkness. <gasps> so Darkness is going to be pivotal in this game because darkness is at every corner and darkness is always coming to take out Mr. Solomon Kane. Now, the darkness is going to be the uh, sin that is sweeping through the yep. alleys. It's, it's the wind that you feel on the back of your neck when you're walking through the city streets of New mm -hmm. York at midnight and thinking to yourself, I've had 12 too many cocktails and three margarita glasses and I should probably not be out at this time. But Not I know that Frank a Sinatra song? song? You, that's not what you think when you're in New York? Okay. No, I, I know there's a sauna that. down the street, and as far as I'm concerned, my friends are all going to be there. So I'm going to continue winding my way down this crooked pathway in the cobblestone, uh, night midnight air with the clouds mm. moving over the sky. The, Romantic. The moon slightly obscured. It's a mm. new moon in this scenario, of course. And the Ooh. werewolves howling in the rafters. Are you going to stop me at yes. any point here? Yes, right now, actually. like, I'll continue going through with this. <laughs> so the shadows in this game are basically your main automata enemy. And every... After every player's turn, they're going to activate. But here's the thing. There's a difference between surrounding and not surrounding yeah, yeah, yeah. figures on the board. Ooh, this is so important. Every card has three sections. The first section is just based on the storybook. We don't care about that. The second section I mean, well, is... We care about it during the storybook. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But when we're on the board, when we're using physical miniatures... The first section refers to anything that is surrounding Solomon Kane. Directly Kame. adjacent to or where on your space. he is. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, it counts as well. Those minis are the only ones that will be affected by any text that is there. And then, not surrounding minis, then activate by the bottom action. Why is this important? Well, it's because these things will be seeking out Solomon Kane, moving into his region, and then trying to attack him. And the order of events is important with how you resolve them. Yes. If they're surrounding, well, they're going to move in and attack. Mm -hmm. If they're not surrounding, well, they're going to get closer and potentially attack if they're able to. If you read them both and resolve <laughs> both of them at the same time, then something that is far away can move really close. Oh, yeah. It'll be just swooping across the map. And the then turn. attack. Again, if you want to get a game that's more difficult, use the rule book, everybody. It's on the first or third page. It's great. It's like an ice cream truck in New York City as you're walking towards that sauna that I was talking about down the block with the midnight Jesse? sky. Do you approach that ice cream truck Je and no. get yourself a Snickers-flavored nope. lollipop? Nope. No, you don't. Nope. No, you don't. And with that, mm -hmm. let's talk about the darkness limit, which also has to do with, of course, Ooh, ice cream yeah. trucks. Oh, okay. This I little track know. here is mm. going to be pushing up, just like all of your other three virtues. Uh, they're going to be built off of the idea of modifying or controlling certain elements of the game. Yep. Your strength check, your clarity check, and your compassion check will all be core dice rolling and resolve sequences. Tests, yep. This is going to be the only thing that operates slightly different. It's yes. going to be built off of how much darkness you can actually have on the table. The mm -hmm. lower this is, the lower of the number you see down below, it's not how many spawn, it's specifically how many can spawn. 
And you want that low. If you're already at maximum, meaning you're, let's say, down here at four, only two can exist on your board. If there mm -hmm. are already two on there, you're not adding another one no matter what the card says. However, there is one exception. There's a little token that's horrible and, dis and, and, and nasty. It's right over there. It's a little bit brown. That is called the threshold or the danger threshold. If the game instructs you to put a token on top of one of the areas... That'll modify, modify but, it. But, yes, in general, always keep in mind where you're at on that danger track because it will yep. save Solomon's life. 100%. The next thing that we want to talk about is actually about physical space. Okay. And I don't mean in the metaphysical format, right? Do you mean what I normally uh, cross boundaries around? Yes, exactly, all the time. Yes, so <laughs> the way that this works is minis represent space, right? They, yeah. they take up space. And sometimes in a lot of these miniatures-based games, you have to determine what can fit in a space. Usually there's restrictions like, oh, three can fit in a space, four can fit in a space. No, in this game it's much more literal. If half of the base of a mini can fit on that weird squiggly line area, it is on the space. That means that you can keep shoving in minis and minis and minis if they all at least have half of their bases in there. So that could potentially change because all minis have different diameter bases. So, so you could potentially have a space that could fit 20. Or just big hips. <laughs> or a space that can only fit four. You just have to take in consideration that nice little circle. Mm -hmm. And that's all you need to know about miniature placement. Yeah, uh, the next thing on my list is going to be the idea of movement, mm -hmm. encounters. So there's two key words, and you can add in anything you want here, but for yep. me, when a darkness is moving, there's going to be two core things that can resolve. First off, if you have one of your virtues down on the board and it is moving into that space, oh, yeah. they are shattering, <sighs> the darkness is being removed, the virtue is being removed, and everything around it is being removed if it's darkness. Well, all yes. the darkness around it is being removed. Yep, it yep. allows you to control the board state, sweep through kind of a, a nice gust of wind, virtue cleaning everything up. Wave. You can also use the virtue, increase your darkness, and hold it at bay. Why would you want to do this? Well, some situations you just can't sacrifice a virtue. You need mm -hmm. the added bonus or the mm -hmm. added effect. And other situations, you're trying to time it so you can remove more darkness by a single virtue explosion. Yep. And so you want to give it a little bit of space. The other thing that I noted when it came to positioning and movement mm -hmm. on this board is going to be moving into Solomon Kane. Yep. When you do that, you're going to immediately go ahead and trigger a event. Uh, I believe the darkness is going to be woofed away yes, as well because yes, it, it kind of shatters against him mm -hmm. but this will give you some negative consequences and then finally encounters yes if there's something that is an encounter on the board and you move into that space you don't have to engage with it search it anything like that it's going to be a card trigger you're at the going end to, of your turn at the end of your turn you have to resolve your action you have to finish your movement on that space if you move through the space it doesn't count nothing happens yep but if you end your turn on an encounter mm -hmm. space that is when and where it'll trigger there's nothing else you can do to engage with that and there's yep. nothing else you need to do to engage mm -hmm. with that anything so, else when it comes to movement actually yes so the next thing that i'll mention is about summoning darkness onto the board and a little bit about immortals which are basically just the figures that don't actually exist in the physical realm. We had an instance where Solomon Kane was in the same space as a summoning portal. And coincidentally, a shadow came into that space. The rule book states that it only engages Solomon Kane when it moves into that space. And we thought, oh, so it could just coexist there because it didn't move True. into. Here's the thing where we were wrong. Always assume it's coming from another thing. Yes, basically, even if you're at the edge of the board, the ghost is just moving into that space and that's going to apply with anything from virtues etc things are moving there's into no place. difference in summoning rules spawning rules versus movement rules. yep if it is appearing it is moved into that space and as a little small caveat another little rule that you might forget in mortals or specifically virtues two of them can never exist in the same space okay that is something that uh, could drift from your mind from time to time oh the other huge element that we needed to remember and constantly remind ourselves again because apparently we just like to make games as hard as possible for us is modifications to your stat board based <sighs> on how well you it do. It was so nice when we discovered this. Story-based mission. So when you go into a story-based mission, you're going to have this small track here which represents the fight against light and mm -hmm. darkness. 
your objective is to have as many light tokens here in order to brighten the path for Solomon Kane to move forward yep. and avoid the malice that awaits for him probably around the bend when you go to a weird sauna in New York City, which you shouldn't do Are ever, especially no. at 12. You can go by yourself. It'll be one by the time we get there. Mm, nope, nope. Either way, so the idea is that if you're able to place three light tokens, you get to raise or lower one stat on your stat board by one. By the way, you can only raise strength, clarity, and compassion. You will want to lower your danger. Mm -hmm. However, if you're able to push the limits and break through the, the minimum threshold of three and get to four, you get to modify two stats any amount of spaces, right? Those two spaces. And finally, if you're able to be incredible and basically guide Solomon Kane towards the most virtuous of all, you get to do five tokens and you get to move three spaces. That is absolutely critical as you start moving around in the game because it allows you to develop your characters yeah. and through an entire chapter-based campaign, you're definitely going to want to develop all of your stats to kind of be equal or, ex depending on what you're doing, a little bit higher than the rest. Yeah. All right? Essential. On the next thing on my list, we're going to go back to these character boards, and we're specifically going to deal with dice rolling. There mm. is a symbol that everyone wants when they roll the dice that's going to be this lovely oh. little cross yes. because Solomon Faith. is summoning, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know. The blood of Christ to descend upon his... Uh, it's more about faith and believing in... Is that... Faith. Okay. Just faith. Not... It's not anything specific. It's faith. Because Jesus Christ himself is rising no. from the dead to... No. Is that not what's... No, just faith in humanity, way, faith in the virtues. These the blessed dice uh, allow you... Yes. ...to do a wild anywhere. Yes. With a few caveats and exceptions. We're yes, going to go correct. through those very quickly. First off... In any place that has a question mark, it doesn't matter what it is. You can place any of them down. In any place that has a cross, you must have a cross to place. Yes. In a location that has a cross and other symbols, you could play two crosses down because one is requiring a certain face and the other one is being used as a wild. Here's the crux. Doesn't sound like we're using the wilds for much wild at the moment. You cannot use a double wild to cover two different types of faces. Mm -hmm, However, mm -hmm. you could use a blank dice from the center point to place down with another wild dice. Yes. Basically, all I'm trying to say is the wild dice can be used for literally anything except two of them on a single action if they're covering two different or two similar faces. You cannot use and chain wild dice multiple times. Yes. Unless, or however, if one of them is being used as a non-wild, mm -hmm. as a direct cross face, or is filling a slot of a question mark. So remember, crosses are aces. And the final point that we will bring to for today is actually a much more minutia term, but it actually appears constantly throughout the rulebook and throughout the campaign, so it is important that people understand how these AI function, and at, that is vandals and seekers. So usually, when a character is brought into the board, they're going to have a behavior, and they're going to have objectives and things that they okay. want to do. You'll see in the rule book that a character might say, Jesse Anderson, seeker, quacks, right? So that means that the Jesse Anderson miniature is looking for anything that quacks on the board. True. And here's the crux. Usually you would expect that most of these AI function around these cards. Like if you read this, it says a sentry moves, a scout moves, etc. You would expect like, oh, this, the seeker moves? The seek no, seekers always move at the yep. end of every single player's turn and that is important because they will always move always move one space towards their seeking target or yep. their target period okay and here's the other element that sometimes gets mixed in with seekers and that is called vandal so vandals are all about removing tokens from the board they're trying to destroy or take away mm. things that you really need and don't want them to have but they're not as overpowered as that might sound they'll start as a seeker once mm -hmm. they arrive to a location, they will then begin to vandalize it, but not all at the same time. Exactly. They won't immediately destroy it. In other words, vandals take tokens from the board only when mm -hmm. they do not move on that turn. And make sure that you remember that because, again, if you want to make the game more difficult, use the recommended settings from the publisher. So, that's going to be our list of 11 things that we uh was it 11 missed so yes when it comes to uh solomon king now that being said Ooh. the gameplay was fun yes it was we had a grand old time and yes. most of the rules we missed made the game more difficult for ourselves 
or reduced our degree of strategy, which makes me just yes. want to dive into it again and more. But we did play correctly. But we did think that you all would enjoy a video where we broke down not only some of the things that we overlooked so that we don't mm -hmm. teach you wrong in the gameplay, mm -hmm. but also some of the things that you can take away for your own gameplay experience when you sit down and start diving into this. 100%. And thank you so very much for watching the video. If you like what we did, make sure to leave a comment, a subscribe, a notification bell, share with your friends, come to do things, like all, all the things that you can do to support us. But regardless of hey, what Jim. you do. What? Noggin. Did you seek the quack? I did. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Have you seen Dory? Dory? Like the fish? Yeah, the turtles. Noggin. No, I didn't hear that one. I didn't. I don't the, remember the noggin. Sea, the sea turtles.